Hello and welcome to the Unnamed Sports Show here on the Sports Talk Line Network, where we talk sports 24-7, 365. I am your host, Joshua Griffith, here to get you caught up in the world of sports from a Canadian perspective, of course. So before we get going, I want you to uh, make sure you hit the like button, subscribe, and also comment and join in on the show. Uh, my producer, Lee, is fantastic, so uh, let's get him working here a bit and uh, reading all those comments. <laughs> Sorry, Lee. Um, so today I will be talking Vancouver Whitecaps as they have a big match Sunday evening against the Montreal Impact. Uh, hold on if you're a basketball fan. Um, don't tune out, you know, another great guest on the show today. So you could leave here very well informed about the MLS and also maybe maybe become a Whitecaps fan. So Vancouver was able to take care of Toronto FC 3-2 on Saturday evening. I spoke with Alexandre Gagne Ruzik on Thursday to break it all down. So. Um, Without further ado, we're going to cue that up. So, Lee, if you could uh, bring that up and roll it in uh, three, two, and one. So, I hope you enjoy. So, I am joined now by Alexandre Gange Ruzik, editor in chief for BTS Between the Sticks, Vancouver, and co host of the podcast by the same name. Alex, thank you very much for joining me today. Yeah, thanks for uh, thanks for having me, Josh. It's a, it's a pleasure to be on. I hope uh, hope you're doing well today, and I'm excited to chat some some white caps. Yeah, I'm excited to chat some white caps too, especially after we have a win to talk about. So, first off, I, I just want to make sure that you and your family and and you have been staying safe and healthy during these times, you know, as strange as they are. Yeah, likewise. Hopefully, everyone on my end uh, doing well and. Uh, Everyone's staying safe, so hopefully uh, over you, you as well, uh, over on the island, uh, it's doing well and staying safe because it's been it's been a weird one. Yeah. Twenty twenty, that's for sure. It's been a weird one. Yeah, twenty twenty has been a ride, but yes, we are we're doing good over here. Me and my family are are doing safe and all staying healthy as well. Uh, definitely limiting limiting our bubbles and and outings as much as we can still, even with uh, you know the restrictions ease, but. So we have the big Whitecaps 3-2 win over Toronto FC. I mean, you were about 14 feet, I want to say, to, to the left of me during it, during BC Place. Uh, what did you think of, uh, of, of, geez, I guess the first win in, in a long time for the Whitecaps? Yeah, I think um, there's obviously a few sides to it. I think that it's a great on the, just from the Whitecaps perspective to win, to score goals at this point. As you know, as I was kind of joking at one point last week, I'm like, at this point, they'd take an own goal off someone's the back of someone's skull at this point just to break the 400, nearly 400 minute scoring drought they went through, the victory drought. They just wanted to win. And I think, considering the caliber of opponent, Toronto FC is a very good team. I think, you know, the Whitecaps saw that firsthand. It was huge just to win at home against them. I think if you break down the game itself, there are certainly maybe some areas of improvement areas of concern you know the defense was pretty solid for the most part but they did struggle to close down the Toronto midfield at times you know maybe the goals they didn't generate as many chances as they want obviously set piece dominance was a good positive impact that they showed the first goal was a very well worked team goal but they definitely didn't maybe show enough of that possession based play but aside from those little things I think it was just huge to get on the board with three points and show you know show that okay we can win games again it's not just going to be an endless losing streak without without any goals scored so i i want to talk about that first goal a bit because i mean you went into in depth a little bit in an article that you did and uh, you know you kind of just broke down and i noticed you talked about just like i think there was a you said 27 progressive passes just um you know before the chance for ali adnan and two um i thought that something that uh was touched on earlier in the week in in the press conferences just how they they talked about how they were practicing at bc place and they were trying to use the any advantages they could get from the artificial turf i thought that, that first goal was a perfect example of using the artificial turf to their advantage um i just you know what did you think of that first goal by cavallini but obviously it's great for him to get off the snide and you can see it well, it's interesting because you look at the other goal, you think of the Michael Baldissimo goal, goal of the week candidate, amazing goal. I preferred the first goal, to be honest. It was that nice just because it was such a well-worked goal. And obviously the Baldissimo goal is nice for a multitude of reasons, but you know, it, it's a circumstantial goal. It's a great individual effort. I just think it was nice to see the Whitecaps. By my count, I rewatched the footage. I think it was just, it was 25 passes total 
Mm -hmm. um, there was three passes, a foul happened, they restarted the play, and then from there was another 22 passes until the ball reached Cavallini for the header. And for me, I just liked the patience they showed. They, they stood at the back. They, we've seen that before. But for the first time in a while, at least, they got the ball with Hassal. They played it up to Andy Rose, and then they played it to Eric Goodwin on the right. And often we'd see with Ali Adnan or Jake Nerwinski, whoever the fullbacks would be, look up, no one there, kick it long, give away possession, repeat. Whereas this time, twice specifically, Goodwin looked up, saw a, a striker dropping back into space, played him. And even though the striker didn't turn and go run upfield, he played it back, but it moved Toronto's defense around. Okay, they didn't, they kept possession. They kind of broke their lines a bit. They moved them. And then they did that three times. And on the third time, they get it to Baldissimo. He switches plate. All of a sudden, Toronto has five guys on one side. The Whitecaps are in acres of space. They capitalize. And for me, that's kind of possession soccer. You look at possession, yeah. People maybe romanticize the idea of keeping 70% possession. It's not all about just the numbers. It's about what you do with it. And for me, if you're keeping possession, be it 30 or 70, I want your attacks to be like that. You want to destabilize their defenses. You want to move them around. And I think the Whitecaps, they did an excellent job of just making Toronto FC chase them for once. And from the first two games we saw, they didn't do much of that. So it was good to see the Whitecaps do that for, for a bit of a change, let's say. Do you think that had anything to do with tactically Mark DeSanto switching to the 4-3-1-2 and they were kind of able to, because I noticed they, you know, they really flanked out their center backs really wide and they had Baldissimo drop down right in the middle there. They were able to, you know, work it back with Hassal and like you said, really stretch uh, Toronto FC, you know, left and right wide on the pitch before they wanted to go north and south. Do you think that that was, uh, you know, the, that 4-3-1-2 is something that we're going to maybe see forward? Yeah, I do think... I think it's less maybe the 4 3 one two itself. I think it was very circumstantial. I do still think the Whitecaps' best formation is a 4 3 3 I will stand by that. But I do like yeah. what the 4 3 one two brought offensively. But I just think it was that extra body in midfield because when they're playing five at the back, they were solid, but they just gave up too much in midfield and they weren't, you know, they weren't getting the ball to their midfield, at least with that extra body in there with, the, you know, Wusu, Tybert, and then, Baldissimo and then you have a Milinkovic kind of as a number 10 they they were able to match up with Toronto who usually dominates the midfield and they found a way to break through obviously missing Michael Bradley I think helps because he's an underrated defender maybe in MLS a, a lot of people talk about his passing ability I think his defense for Toronto is very missed but I do think having that extra body in a 4-3-1-2 is crucial and I think I hope to see more more you know that 4-3-3 slash 4-3-1-2 going forward just at least from an offensive perspective, because defensively, yes, the 5-3-2 is great, but I don't think the Whitecaps, you're looking at your defenders that you have and what you've seen. I don't think the defense, having five defenders is not the problem. No, and I would agree with you on that. I, I don't think that would, that's the problem. I mean, I think where they were getting, you know, kind of torches between, like you said, between the defenders and, and the midfield, just giving up too much room. And we did see that a fair bit, on Saturday with TFC is Pozuelo and Pablo Piatti had some pretty great chances where they were able to just kind of walk in a man and just fire shots on, on Hassal, who uh, is just looking more and more like a comfortable MLS goalkeeper. Uh, I was just wondering if you could talk about, you know, what you thought about his play in, uh, in the game on Saturday. I just see with Hassal, I see he's a growing goalkeeper and it's tough for him to concede two goals because I just think, it didn't reflect his overall play. He made some unreal saves in the se in the first half, second half specifically. The first goal, I mean, that's just I, – I, I mentioned that the, this, the other day. I don't know if for anyone who's listening, you want, go back and watch the first goal Jonathan Azorio scores. I don't think it was talked about enough, the technique, to hit that first time with his weak foot across the bar yeah. body. Like, I don't know. Yeah, Josh, he, he, it was pretty and, ridiculous. And, and Hassel was in – Hassel was not out of position at all for the goal. Like, he was – he didn't go too far to the post. He, you know, he was definitely in position. He was having his feet move. And yeah, like you said, just to be able to volley that, just jumping right out of midair, like that's, that's yeah, unbelievably it's, it's, impressive. Like, you know, I mean, Baldissimo's goal, everybody's talking about, but that is a real goal too. I mean, it, we saw some good goals on Saturday night. <laughs> yeah, no, we were definitely blessed in that department because that was a ridiculous goal. So I'm not going to look at Hassal and be like, you should you should do more because I see the breakdown more as the passes leading up to the goal and ditto with the second it was just you know Hassal maybe was caught in a bit of no man's land and that's tough for a goalkeeper because it's a split second you see Piatti has the ball all of a sudden he cuts in and whips one in 
and you're caught on your line, Pozuelo heads it home. I'm not going to fault him on that. Maybe a different goalkeeper might not, that might not be a problem. Some goalies are a lot more aggressive, but Hassal, what I like for his age is that he is, he's not shy. I mean, first of all, you hear him screaming instructions. You, you hear him directing traffic. That's great. But just, he, he loves to get off of his line. And it's interesting with Max Crepeau, who's an excellent goalkeeper in his own right. They're very two differently styled goalkeepers. I see Max Crepeau, he's very comfortable on the line. And that's very, it, partly yes, because he's not the tallest goalkeeper. Um, you know, maybe he could use his, adva- his height uh, to his advantage a bit more by coming out more, but he's a very, his reflexes are through the roof. He's, he, you know, he moves very well, so he stays on his line. Whereas Hassal, he loves to come out and play the angles game, and that's huge to see against some, some players just because when you're a striker, when you're looking up and you see a goalkeeper coming out at you, and Hassal's a big kid. He's, he's what, 6'3", 6'4", or 6'2". You'd be surprised how tall he is. It, it, it may really makes it tougher for attackers to, to kind of to find the holes, to, to shoot behind him, and that's why he's, he's made some really good saves. Obviously, there's a lot of things to still clean up as a young goalkeeper. His distribution is a bit inconsistent sometimes he can play a great long ball sometimes not so much and but I see confidence I see you know I see a growing ability I think there's a lot more to come from Hassan. and I definitely see a, a good body of work to build off of just because he's a he's a really well-rounded goalkeeper I'm glad you mentioned just about his um, distribution because I I thought that it was pretty well uh pretty good in on, on saturday and has been getting progressively better i mean obviously in the first couple of games he was just he was going to put pass it out and he just sky it right out of bounds try over alley at nan's head and just out well, walk away with his head down just shaking his head but it looks now too and he, he almost seems like and i guess it's probably you know games um but he just looks more comfortable now just making that one easy quick pass to you know to the center back or you know to uh, the, you know, the midfielder who's dropping deep and quite happy to receive another pass back. And, and you know, he doesn't almost looking like he's it, the, the pressure is kind of coming off more as the more he plays the ball with his feet. Mm-hmm. And I think it's only going to get better. It's hard to play these passes that goalkeepers have to play. And I think Vancouver's blessed that Crepeau has the playing ability of a midfielder. You, you forget that sometimes that he's just really talented with the ball at his feet and it's not easy. And I, uh, to give us all credit, it's not a confidence thing. And I mean, in his first game or his first full game against Chicago, he, he, he danced around someone at the back and gave half of Vancouver a heart attack, at least those who were watching. Uh, but yeah, right. <laughs> he's, he's, not, he's not lacking for confidence. So I think the more he gets used to just having the ball at his feet and having to play some of those balls that you need your goalkeepers to play in the modern game, it's, it's definitely not a, something I'm worried about going forward. And that's, and I mean, that's the thing people got to realize too. Like the whole sweeper keeper philosophy it hasn't been around for that long I mean you know there's a I'm sure if you look look at some of the you know the elder goalkeepers they are still not comfortable having to play the ball at their feet and they're like no I'll just you know let it roll to me or head it to me and I'll pick it up and throw it out to you or boot it long but uh so I mean that is is something to take notice um so you know you kind of mentioned it before when you were talking about BC Place and being there um and being able to hear Hassal and I thought it was really interesting, you know, the piped in crowd noise that we had um, for the players and obviously for the media. And I think a little bit, so we didn't hear as much from the players and technical staff, but we did get a a fair bit of stuff that uh, came and we got to hear. So I I just was wondering what you thought about, about that and just the the experience and and maybe how, you know, it would have been for the players to kind of play under that because Pablo Piatti was hilarious. (laughs) Yeah, well, it's like, personally, I won't shy away. I'm not a fan of the crowd noise. I don't think uh, that's just me yeah, personally. No, I'm, I wasn't. I was not either. No. I, I, my eyes, I mean, I can tolerate the digital overlays as long as it doesn't impede my ability to see the ball. And that's on TV. So live, that wasn't a problem. Yeah. But I'm kind of, my brain is more of a, you know, I just like to see things as it is. And it's kind of trippy. Okay, why are there empty stands and people screaming? That bell, that bell digital thing. Was, it was, yeah, no, it was so like even like that. It, even if you want to talk about the Adidas logo at MLS's <laughs> back, like, it's, it, I get it. Sponsorships, it's no. not pretty. Let's, let's be honest, it's not pretty. So, I mean, from that, that's a whole other story. But the crowd noise, yes, on one hand, I, obviously it's tough because it's you know the supporters are singing that, and with no supporters there, it just doesn't feel right. But at the same time, it does give a bit of comfort just hearing those noises again so I can see the the value to it I'm not a fan personally but 
it did kind of add to the atmosphere. It was nice, though, to hear the players. I think it's a very underrated aspect to hear what coaches yeah. yell when, when, when their team has the ball, when it doesn't have the ball, what players say to refs. I mean, there was some pretty funny interchanges between uh, some of the players and the refs after, after fouls and all that and just scoring. And when, they- when teams score, they're really – it's just it's very immersive and i feel like that's very cool to get as a, an experience you know yeah it was i mean it was really um interesting to see when vanny sartini was really vocal i noticed it loud. probably like even more so than mark or phil but um yeah that was a, a really cool aspect and uh, i'll be excited to uh, to try and uh, you know listen a little bit harder on i'm going to try and maybe find some listening device that i can bring in and maybe pick up some more of the audio on sunday cuz uh, yeah it was a uh, it was great stuff. So, obviously, I mean, we had that game. And since the uh, Toronto FC took care of Montreal Impact, uh, the Whitecaps Canadian Championships are officially done. I mean, officially because they were kind of already done anyway. But uh, I mean, we still have the Montreal game to look forward to this Sunday. And um, what do you expect out of the Whitecaps coming this weekend? I do think they still want to get as many points as possible because I do think Mark DeSantos kind of knows that this next phase is not going to be good for them and I don't I don't say that saying I don't think they're gonna not do well or this and that but I just think it's not for the Canadian teams in particular the fact that they might have to go you know it's for Canadian teams it's such an uncertain future I can't even say anything because there's just there's no news and it, it whatever all the stuff the stories we hear aren't favorable either they spend two months in the u.s which that's just not an ideal proposition i mean i don't think games are going to be played in canada after this at least not between american teams and canadian ones so that's also going to be a thing so they, they want as many points as they can before the uncertainty hits what they know now is they have two chances to play montreal a team they've already played at home just get six points on the board that's the what the chance they have to do all of a sudden they do that they have by my math, that would be 15 points, which is not anything to write home about, but that puts them, you know, maybe a little more in the MLS playoff race than you would have expected considering how they've played this year. You know, because one advantage of this is that their losses to Toronto and Montreal, they hurt for the Canadian Championship, but in MLS, they're in the other conference. It means zero from the, they're not giving away points to teams around them. So they've kind of clawed, clawed back in. So I think they, they'll want to just get the six points for those reasons. And then from there, they might lose some players who might opt out reasonably. So I think that's fair if anyone opts out from having to stay a month or two in the U.S. I wouldn't, I wouldn't fault any players for wanting to do that, especially those with young families. And, and from what DeSanto said, the schedule is packed. There's going to be games every two, three days. They're going to have to test their depth. So it's not going to be easy. So I think it's just going to be get those as many points as you can before with your best players with favorable schedule at home and then just kind of go from there really yeah absolutely and i agree i mean got to take advantage of, of your home games while you even have any left so i'm uh, joined here by alexander gogne ruzik of uh between the sticks and uh, so alex thanks again for joining me here on the on name sports show um just got one more because we got some uh, some news Thursday morning about the Whitecaps as they made some changes in the front office. Um, and they will be adding a chief revenue officer, uh, chief marketing officer, and also creating a director of community diversity and inclusion on the Whitecaps. So I just wanted to get your um, your thoughts on that. And obviously, um, Mark or Axel Schuster will be uh, speaking to the media here uh, at some point on Thursday. And we'll get a little bit more uh, clarification on things. But I just wanted to get your initial thoughts on the notes. Well, it's tough to say what the move will end up bringing to the club long term. I do think this is certainly some of the fallback of, you know, releasing Mark Panis, which, you know, maybe uh, definitely someone I would have, I think most people agreed should have, would I would have kept on. I think he, what he brought to the club was quite valuable. Obviously, there was some sort of difference in opinion. I I don't have the full story, so, you know, I can't, don't want to make anything up or speculate, but obviously things didn't work out between the two. They parted ways and it's just kind of tough as it feels like they're just kind of filling the holes behind that, that move. And I do think that until we know who these people are, it's not, we won't, and see what they're able to do. We won't judge them. Obviously it's tough on Axel Schuster that he's got to fill two hats now. And I think on the footballing side, he seems to be doing a, 
pretty solid job, at least with the signings. They seem on paper to be good signings. We need to see a lot more. We need to see what they end up doing all together and long term. So you, you don't want to put the book fully out on that. But I think off the pitch, it's a tough it's a tough one for him because obviously there's the combined circumstances now. It's not an easy time to be a sports owner. And also, especially the fact that the Whitecaps have gone through so much, so much turmoil. It's not an easy time to be a Whitecaps owner, you know, dealing with, with some of the fans definitely aren't very happy with what's going on at the club. So it's, it's, it's not an enviable position for someone like Schuster, who's just come into the, the club to have to, to deal with all that. So obviously we want to see what these moves bring. And I think, you know, maybe maybe long term the Whitecaps might have to end up exploring some other options, and you know, maybe who knows? Maybe an ownership shift might be the way to go. I obviously you need a stable ownership, so if if a new owner is coming in and he's unstable, you don't want that either. But assuming that a new stable ownership comes in, that might be the best ploy. But definitely until until that comes about, it what all they can do is really, you know, change things here and there, and hopefully a uh, at least provide some support to Axel Schuster. I think if those moves do that, that will be big just because his job title is a very all encompassing one and the more help he could get, the better. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. And it'll be interesting to see where, uh, where they go with these hires and things like that. So Alex, thank you. Thank you again for joining me here. Um, just let people know what you're working on, what they can expect from uh, between the sticks and, and yourself here coming up in the future. Yeah. So I guess you can just find me on Twitter at Alex Gongeruzic. Um, at BTS Van City and writing btsvancity.com, Whitecaps, Canadian Premier League, the whole nine yards. And also, if you like, if you like listening to podcasts, we got the third sub podcast with uh, my guy Samuel Rowan. So shout out to that, and it's a pleasure to be on the show, Josh. Uh, been loving uh, what you've been doing with the with the unnamed sports show. Love the love the name. I don't think you're ever gonna get rid of it, though. Are, no, are you? I don't. I don't think so. No, I think it's I think stuck it's, now. Yeah. At this point, <laughs> you, you you've gone how what 20 20 episodes in Close, already yeah. so yeah i'm getting so. i'm getting 17 so yeah I, I think it's stuck now so so it was a pleasure to be on and uh thanks for having me but thank you again and i hope you have yourself a great day cheers all right so i want to thank my guest again uh, alex from between the sticks fan city for joining me to uh chat vancouver whitecaps so i am actually off to vancouver today and going to be covering the game for sports talk line so uh, make sure to check out the sports talk line website um going to be lots of pre and post game coverage and also make sure to follow me on Twitter at Joshua Griffith zero as I'll be giving you live interactive updates from BC place during the game. So I want to thank everybody for watching the unnamed sports show here on sports talk by network again, where we talk sports 24 seven and there is lots of sports to talk about as uh, the NFL football is back in uh, action. So make sure to follow everybody on the sports talk by network, check out the YouTube channel here like and subscribe and uh, stay tuned for next week because I will have some more great guests and uh, get you caught up with sports as always so I have been your host Josh Griffith here on the Unnamed Sports Show and remember to love sports all sports <laughs>